colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome you all here. My name is Emeritus Professor Philip Stott, and I've been interested in this topic for a very long time indeed. And I've taken a long interest in this, and it's a real pleasure for me here now to come to chair this session on what is perhaps one of the most hubristic acts that has been passed by any parliament in the, the world, the Climate Change Act. And what we're going to do today, we're going to go from the science with Dr. Plymer, Professor Plymer, to the structures that have been dealing with the IBCC, the IPCC with Donna, Donna Lamprofos, who are, many of you will know and has been a marvellous contributor to this. We will then go on to the economics of the issue with Ruth, and we will end with the politics of energy with Matt Ridley, one of our finest science writers in the world today. But the context is very simple, and just to start us off, China's emissions, as you now know, under the 2010 measures, represent 24.6% of world emissions, way above, for example, the US now at 16%. The 2010 figures on 2009 in terms of emissions for the UK are up 3.8%. World, they're up between 5 to 5.9%. But it's actually more than that because what is interesting is the intensity is also up, which is really in some ways surprising, but it's up 5.8% with a world growth, some places still have growth, of 5.1%. So the intensity is up. So... We're in a background here where the world has changed, the plate tectonics of the politics have moved to the Pacific Rim, to the countries of the BRIC, to the countries of the basic world. The whole agenda in this sense has changed. Europe, of course, as we know, is now in the most appalling state economically, with all sorts of consequences in terms of many, many other policies. And in terms of this world context, not just the science, which has all sorts of problems attached to it as well, but the Climate Change Act increasingly looks like an act of enormous folly for, Europe, for, for British politics and for British economics. In a sense, it leaves us increasingly in an isolated position. And the idea that we actually have an influence morally on other countries in this respect is declining all the time. We saw that at Copenhagen, we've seen it at Cancun, and we'll see it even more at Durban. This is the context. And I'm afraid, looking at purely as an academic, as we look forward, it is very unlikely that the British Parliament will be able to hold such an act anyway for much longer. It simply will not be tenable in economic and political terms. So what we're going to look at today is what is the state effectively of the science, the state of the United Nations approach to this with Donna, the state of the economics with Ruth, and then, very crucially, taking us to the politics and the energy issue which is going to be raised by Matt. So may I first of all call on Ian, very kindly, Dr. Dr. Plymer, Professor Plymer from Australia, who many of you will know, author of course of very, very important books, including his new one, How to Get Expelled from School, <laughs> which I have here, absolutely sorry, The Guide to Climate Change for Pupils, Parents and Punters, and who in Australia and down under has been one of the leading protagonists trying to bring a true geological perspective to the whole idea of climate change. Professor Plymer. Well, thank you for coming. I'm a geologist, and the one thing that we miss out on in looking at climate change is the past. Climates have always changed. Climate changes in the past have been greater and faster than anything we experience in our lifetime. And sea levels have always changed. Not by the modest couple of millimetres that people are having conniptions about, but we've had in the past sea level changes of only 1,500 metres. That's a sea level change. And if we look back in the history of time, the atmosphere once had a very large amount of carbon dioxide in it. It's now got less than 0.04%. Where did that carbon dioxide go to? It went into chalk limestone, shells and life. And we've been sequestering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere for only 2,000 to 500 million years. This planet has been degassing carbon dioxide since it first formed on that Thursday, 4,567 million years ago. Carbon dioxide is a natural gas. It has dominated the atmosphere for an extraordinarily long period of time. And we now 
uh, at a dangerously low level. If we halved the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we would have no terrestrial plants. Carbon dioxide is plant food. It is not a pollutant. To use words like pollution with carbon dioxide is misleading and deceptive. But the past gives us a wonderful story. In the past, we've had six major ice ages. We are currently in an ice age. It started 34 million years ago when South America had the good sense to pull away from Antarctica and there was a <laughs> circumpolar current set up which isolated Antarctica and we started to get the Antarctic ice sheet. We've had periods of glaciation and interglacials. We are currently in interglacial. And during that 34 million years, we have refrigerated the Earth. But for less than 20% of time, we have had ice on planet Earth. The rest of the time, it's been warmer and wetter. And there's been more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what did life do? It thrived. Six of the six great ice ages were initiated when the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was higher than now. In fact, up to a thousand times higher. So we have from the geological evidence absolutely no evidence that carbon dioxide has driven climate. For some odd reason, the major driver of climate is that great ball of heat in the sky, which we call the sun. That's, that's, you heard it here first. It's really quite unusual. And we change our distance from the sun. Every 100,000 years, our orbit changes from elliptical to circular. And we have a cycle of 90,000 years of cold and 10,000 years of warm. We're in one of those warm cycles now. And every 43,000 years, the axis of the Earth changes a little bit. And every 21,000 years, we get a bit of a wobble. Each of those orbital events put us further from the sun. Every now and then, we get bombarded by cosmic rays coming from a supernova eruption somewhere out there. And if the sun's magnetic field cannot drive these away, we start to form low-level clouds. We've got extremely good evidence that this process has been going on for a very long period of time. Every now and then, continents start to move. And they move at very rapid rates. They move about this much every year. And at one time, a continent can be over a pole. At another time, it can be at the equator. Those moving continents change the major heat balance on the Earth. And that's the ocean currents. The oceans carry far more heat than the atmosphere. Every now and then, because of major geological processes, we'll get a great bulge on the ocean floor of new volcanic rock. That changes ocean currents. Every year, we have 10,000 cubic kilometres of seawater that goes through new volcanic rocks in the ocean floor. That exchanges heat. The reaction between seawater and the rocks stops the oceans becoming acid. When we run out of rocks, the oceans will become acid, but don't wait up. It will be a long time. We see 1,500 terrestrial volcanoes on planet Earth. We only measure 20 of them, and very few of those uh, measurements are really accurate. But they tell us that a little bit of carbon dioxide leaks out of those volcanoes. But what we don't hear is that there are at least 3.47 million volcanoes on the sea floor which leak out huge amounts of carbon dioxide. We have got pools of liquid carbon dioxide on the sea floor. So, early Earth's carbon dioxide, where did it go? It went into rocks. Where did it come from? It came from rocks. What did it do to the planet? We did not fry and die. We didn't have runaway greenhouse. Well, that's just geology. That, that's not important. So let's, let's look at more modern times. In more modern times, we have drill cores that have gone through the ice sheets. Snow, when it falls, captures some air. That air is then trapped in the ice. We can later extract it from drill core and measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And we can see with our cycles of glaciation and interglacials that when we finish an interglacial event, then we release carbon dioxide some 800 million years later. Uh, sorry, 800 years later. So 
What's that telling us? It's telling us that temperature is driving carbon dioxide, not that carbon dioxide is driving temperature. Oh yes, but that's only hundreds of thousands of years ago. Forget that. Well, let's go to more modern times. We've been measuring temperatures accurately since 1850, and the accuracy is plus or minus one degree Celsius for those ancient measurements. We are being told that this 0.7 degree Celsius rise is going to, is going to create a disaster. I've only got to move over to here, and I've had a 0.7 degree Celsius temperature rise. Where do you people go for your summer holidays? You go to a warmer climate. We are creatures from the Rift Valley. We like warm climates. If someone from Helsinki moves to Singapore, there's an average temperature rise of 22 degrees Celsius. Singaporeans don't drop dead in the streets from the temperature. So we are creatures of warm climates. And we've been measuring temperature and we have seen a slight warming from 1860 to 1890, and then a slight cooling until 1910, then a warming until 1940, so much so that the Northwest Passage was open, then a cooling until 1977, and then a warming until the end of the century, and now we're in a period of cooling. So we've had these cycles of warming and cooling. Strange that these cycles are actually related to changes in the heat balance in the ocean. So we have these 60-year cycles over a long warming event. We are in a period of global warming. It has been warming since the Maunder minimum 330 years ago. These were the times when you had the ice fairs on the Thames. These are the times when the Dutch masters painted hoarfrosts and bitterly cold conditions. That was the time when the sun was a bit inactive and we had no sunspot activity. So we're in a long period of warming, and one of the questions that I ask in this book is which part of the last 330 years of warming is due to human activity, and which part is natural? These are questions that kids should ask their school teachers, and they're deliberately unanswerable questions, because I am of the view that many children are getting fed environmental propaganda in the schools and are not being given the critical and analytical facilities to be able to dissect an argument. So we're in a period of warming. What's the worry? It's quite normal. And let's just look at history. And the one thing that the climate industry, which it is, ignores is history. In Roman times, it was warm. It was considerably warmer than now. And we know that. They kept good records. They grew olives up the Rhine River as far as Bonn. They had wine grapes in Yorkshire. We know from their clothing that it was warm. Possibly they were going through an orgy, but I think it more likely <laughs> it was warm. And that warming suddenly stopped in 535 AD. And we entered the Dark Ages. And in 535 AD, we had Krakatoa fill the atmosphere with aerosols. And it wasn't a big volcano. Only 30 cubic kilometres of aerosols go into the atmosphere. We've had bigger ones in Yellowstone. We've had even bigger ones in New Zealand, where 10,000 cubic kilometres of aerosols have gone into the atmosphere. And we pray for another one, because that's the only way we'll ever beat them at rugby. Just <laughs> wipe them out. <laughs> we had two volcanoes, one in Rabaul and one in Krakatoa in Indonesia in 535, 536. We went into the Dark Ages. It was cool. What happened? Crops failed. We starved. We had civil unrest. We had cannibalism. We broke out of that into the medieval warming. First to feel it was the Vikings. The seas became calmer. They could go further fishing. They actually went to Newfoundland, which they called Vinland. In Greenland, grapes and barley were growing. In Greenland, the graves were deep because there was no permafrost. It was a wonderful, benign climate, five degrees warmer than now. Eric the Red was saying, come to Greenland. It's a wonderful climate, and it was. And then we went through a period of solar inactivity. And in 23 years, we went from the medieval warming into the Little Ice Age. And that Little Ice Age ended 330 years ago. So what do you think would happen after a Little Ice Age? Do you think it'd get colder, or do you think it'd get warmer? The only reason that the arguments of science have got any traction in society is that they have been related to the last 30 years or 40 years of temperature measurements. 
I see with great interest the Met Office is telling us that this is the hottest year on record, but you might be on a different calendar to me, but I don't think this year's finished yet. And uh, this time last year I was in London, as I was the time before, the year before, and it was miserable. It was cold. It was very cold. So those sort of predictions made just before a big climate conference one has to be very sceptical of. So in science, scepticism is not a pejorative word. In science, there is no consensus. In science, there are constant battles. A good example, we all knew that we got ulcers from an acid stomach and from stress. So we took pills and rubbed our bellies and, and hoped the ulcers would go away until two scientists, who were not following the mainstream, who were not following the consensus, were arguing that this was due to a bacterium, and no one listened. Ultimately, one of them took the bacterium, developed ulcers, took the antidote, and for that, they get a Nobel Prize. You do not get a Nobel Prize for following the consensus or saying the science is settled. I believe we've had an enormous corruption of science and the scientific method. I believe that the monies that are floating around for climate research um, which is a current fad and fashion, are quite perverse. I believe we're putting science backwards. And come the next inevitable pandemic, we may not have the weapons to handle it. We might go waving herbs and chanting rather than creating an antidote. So this, for me, this climate industry has been a huge attack on the scientific method. It has been an attack on my science, and history, and things fortunately are changing. I finish with one last point. You have got your Climate Change Act. We've just had a carbon tax in Australia. 19 bills went through Parliament. And our carbon tax is to lower the emissions of carbon dioxide from our employment generating industries in Australia. And it's wonderful. We've led the world in suicide. And <laughs> Our carbon tax is to knock down our emissions by 5%. Now, you can do the sums, and the sums are very simple. The IPCC says that 3% of annual emissions are from humans. Why is it that that 3% drive climate change is beyond me and not the other 97%? But that's another matter. Australia puts out 1.5% of the world's CO2 emissions. You can do the calculations, and by Australia knocking back their emissions by 5%, we will, by the year 2050, have lowered global temperatures by 0 0.00007 degrees Celsius. So I do hope you enjoy our sacrifice in giving you a warmer <laughs> climate here in England. Thank you. Excellent. Ian, very much with great clarity, and it's always marvellous to hear from a geologist. Now, I just want, want to add one point on the science because it's a comparative point. The response of the physics community to the fascinating idea that neutrinos may actually travel faster than light. We've had a double experiment, both at the moment, showing that may or may not be true. But what is interesting is the response of the physics community was twofold. One, excitement. Even though they were going to be sceptical about it, they were excited about it. Because this made the science new and interesting again. Very important. And secondly, of course, they made it open, completely open. They asked all the scientists in the community to participate, to try to replicate the experiments. Just contrast that, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very, very important point with what has happened in the climate change science community. Absolutely the opposite. The horror at any new theory that's come forward, an attempt to kill it off, to, to dampen down the people that are involved in it. And secondly, no excitement at all about it. In other words, fear about it. And that is precisely, I think, the point at the end that Ian was stressing. That is a desperate warping of the real nature and excitement that should be behind true science. Now, what we do in a very timely moment, I think, is with Donna, and many of you will have read Donna's blogs and know of her marvellous work, uh, Donna Laframboise, 
It's marvellous to have her here because she's from Canada, but luckily she was in Germany, I think, Donna, so was able to make the journey over to us here. She is going to tell us about perhaps the organisation above all that has actually pushed through that change in science and viewpoint. So, Donna Lafambos, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time in the uh, Parliament buildings, and this is, um, this is, this is very nice indeed. Um, I have uh, just written a book. It is a, a very new book. It's called um, The Delinquent Teenager Who Was Mistaken for the World's Top Climate Expert, and, which is a very long title. Um, and the, the main argument of the book is that almost nothing that we've been told about the IPCC is true. And the title comes from the fact that when I first started doing research about climate change, I read about this marvelous organization called the IPCC. And I, had, I formed this picture in my mind. It was, it was rigorous and it was respectable and it was dressed in, in business attire and it was a very trustworthy organization. It was a grown-up. And the more I learned about the IPCC, the more that idea, that mental picture changed. And what I started to see instead was a spoiled child, a child that has been praised and admired and flattered for its entire life, a child that was given rules to follow, didn't follow those rules, and faced no consequences as a result. So it seems to me that this spoiled child has now turned into a, an obnoxious teenager and that this teenager has become all of our problems because it, it's, it's a problem for all of us because this organization is writing some very important reports and countries around the world are pointing to the IPCC and saying this is why we have to undertake these very expensive very intrusive changes to, to our lives because the IPCC says so. So something strange is happening to my fonts. I'm sorry about that. Um, so one of the things I think that's useful to, to ask is who writes IPCC reports? And there's actually a list of five quotes on this page, but only one of them is, 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 um, is I'm showing here. So, what the list, the list of this slide should say, uh, should have two quotes from um, from science journalists. It should have a quote from the science press, the energy sector press, and there's a quote from the um, head of UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program. And all of these people are essentially using slightly different words, but they are telling us that that it's the best scientists, it's the top scientists, it is experts in their field who are, it's the world's finest scientific minds, that is who is writing IPCC reports. And indeed, the green NGOs are also um, singing from the same, to, uh, same hymn book. So it's leading scientists, leading climate scientists, the world's brightest scientists. That's who's working on IPCC reports, that's who we're told is. Where did these ideas come from? Well, we can trace them right back to the IPCC's chairman. So the former chairman, Robert Watson, has told us this is the world's best experts. The current chairman, Dr. Regina Pachori, has also said this is the world's best specialist. So it would appear that we have a consensus. And just to give you an idea of the flavor, here is a quote from Chairman Pachori. These are people who have been chosen on the basis of their track record on their record of publications, on the research that they have done. They are people who are at the top of their profession. So everyone agrees that's who writes IPCC reports. Well, I do a lot of investigative work as a journalist, and rather than just accepting what people say, I actually go to the trouble of looking beneath the surface to see if these claims, if there's any actually any evidence for these claims. And what I found was quite startling. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there have not been some brilliant scientists who have been associated with the IPCC. But I am suggesting is that there are a lot of other people who have been helping to write these reports who are not remotely close to being the world's top experts. So who really writes IPCC reports? 
Well, one group is 20-something graduate students. Now, these people are not helping out. These are people who have been given lead author roles on IPCC reports. So we have Richard Klein, who is currently a geography professor. He became an IPCC lead author at age 25. Three years later, the IPCC put him in a leadership role. He was leading a chapter. The problem is he didn't get his PhD until 2003. Now, in academic circles, before you get your PhD, you're pretty invisible on, 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 in the academic world. You are not, by any means, one of the world's top experts. So we have Lawrence Bauer. He was a lead author for the IPCC before he earned his master's degree, never mind his PhD. And Sari Kovats, who is actually a representative of the UK on, uh, on the IPCC, back in 1994, the IPCC decided to write about the very important issue of how climate change affect human health. It shows 21 people from the entire world to look at this, this rather important issue. Sari Kovats was one of those 21 people, but she didn't get there because of her publication record. In fact, it would be three years after before her first academic paper was published. It would be, in fact, 16 years later before she earned her doctorate. But she has been a longtime member of the IPCC and, in fact, is currently working on the upcoming IPCC report. So who else is writing IPCC reports? People who have been appointed because they re represent the right country or they belong to the right gender. Now this is pretty amazing because you know when you're told it's the world's top experts, that's what you expect. Last year, the Inter-Academy Council, which is an organization of science um, academies around the world, decided to launch an investigation into the IPCC. It was the first time anything like that happened. It was pretty remarkable. And as part of their information gathering, they posted a questionnaire online. And they invited people who had participated in the IPCC to answer questions such as, what is your opinion about how the IPCC chooses its lead authors? Those questions were bundled together into a 678-page PDF, which is available online. You can download it. The names of the people were removed, however, so we don't know who is speaking. And if you download that document, you find that as early as page 16, these IPCC insiders are saying that some lead authors are clearly not qualified. Fast forward 100 pages or so, you have someone saying that half of the lead authors in their chapter were not competent, that instead they were politically correct appointments from developing countries. And then fast forward a few more 100 pages and you have someone else saying all IPCC personnel decisions are political before being scientific. Now, I think that's rather alarming, and these are IPCC insiders themselves. Who else? Professional activists have also been helping to write IPCC reports. Now, these are people who are taking paychecks from activist organizations. We have Richard Moss, who has been involved with the IPCC for 20 years. During part of that time, he was a vice president of the World Wildlife Fund. Bill Hare is considered a legend in Greenpeace. He has been a spokesperson since the early 1990s for Greenpeace. And when the last report came out in 2007, he was one of only 40 people who helped to write the synthesis report, which is the summary of summaries, because IPCC reports are thousands of pages. You need some executive summaries. He's in the inner circle writing that report. Now, there are more students, there are more activists, but we, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm, you know, in my book, these are not the only ones by any means. So here's two more, Michael Oppenheimer. He worked for 20 years for the Environmental Defense Fund. It's a very wealthy, very influential activist group in 
um, in the US. He is currently leading an IPCC chapter for the upcoming report. And Jennifer Morgan, she looks like a very pleasant person. I'm sure she'd be really fun to have coffee or drink with. But she is not one of the world's finest scientific minds. If you look at Jennifer's CV, she has spent her entire career working for one activist group after another activist group. And for a while, in fact, she was the World Wildlife Fund's chief spokesperson on climate change. Nevertheless, the IPCC has appointed her to work on its current report. Now, there's another problem with activism and, and the IPCC. And that's that in 2004, something very curious started to happen. And that's that the World Wildlife Fund began very deliberately to recruit IPCC personnel. And by 2008, according to documents available on their website, it had persuaded 130 people that it described as leading climate scientists, mostly but not exclusively from the IPCC, to join its own panel. So this was work on the last IPCC report, AR4, was just beginning around in 2004. So at the very moment that these scientists, these leading climate scientists, were supposed to be making a very neutral and objective and impartial examination of the evidence around climate change, they decided to get into bed with the WWF. And what effect did that have? Well, in two-thirds of the chapters for the last major IPCC report, there was at least one in as many as nine WWF-affiliated scientists working on that. In one-third of the chapters, one of the leaders was a WWF-affiliated scientist. There was a chapter that concluded that 20 to 30 percent of the world's species are threatened with extinction. Both leaders of that chapter were affiliated with the WWF plus six other people. So the IPCC stacked the species extinction chapter with eight WWF people. Are we really surprised that they, can, that they then concluded that species extinction is a big concern with respect to climate change? So a few weeks after my book was released, the WWF issued a press release in which they said, oh, no, no, the, the IPCC hasn't been infiltrated by us. There's a little bit of overlap. There's some overlap. Well, in my view, when two thirds of your chapters are, include WWF people, that's, that's an invasion. That's not a bit of overlap. That's a really big concern. So who really writes IPCC reports? Students, unqualified scientists, professional activists, and scientists who are so unsophisticated and so naive that they don't appreciate that you should not be getting into bed with activist groups at the very moment that you are, have been entrusted by the entire world to take very close and careful um, a look at the evidence around these issues. So what does this mean? It means that a very simple question, who writes IPCC reports? What we think the answer is, what everyone thinks the answer is, is actually, it's, it's wrong. That it's not, and now I'm, I am told as a journalist that there is a consensus about what the science is around climate change. And I, I'm not in a position to know whether that, that consensus is valid or not. But I do know that the consensus around the very simple question of who writes IPCC reports is, is wrong. Okay, now I'm rushing here because my presentation is a bit longer than the time allotted. Um, there are other claims about the IPCC that turn out not to be true. We're told that it's utterly transparent. No, I'm sorry, it's not. And there are a number of people who've looked at that question independently and we've all come to the same conclusion. We're told that there are policies and procedures and that these are followed rigorously. In fact, I'm having a difficult time finding a single rule that the IPCC did follow. Like, really, truly, it's, it's, it's amazing. I've never seen a story like this one. We've been told that the IPCC relies solely on peer-reviewed literature. And um, 
The chairman of the IPCC likes to go around the world saying, we don't settle for anything less than peer-reviewed literature. If it hasn't appeared in a peer-reviewed journal, you can just throw it into the dustbin. That's what he says. But in fact, when I um, invited some people about a year and a half ago to help me on my blog look at the references cited by the 2007 IPCC report, we found approximately one-third of those references were not to peer-reviewed literature. There's a huge gap between the rhetoric of the IPCC and the reality. So there are wider implications, and, the pro and, and what we have then is we have an organization in which lots and lots of people, hundreds, thousands of people are involved with the IPCC. Many, many people knew that a number of the authors who are involved are not remotely the world's finest scientific minds. Many people knew that it was not based solely on peer-reviewed literature. But there have been no open letters. No one apparently took Chairman Pachori aside and said, sir, you can't go around saying that publicly. It's not true. We have an organization that has been saying very misleading things to the public and to policymakers and to lawmakers for a long time. And it's been this conspiracy of silence. And I think that tells us something about the integrity of this organization, about how trustworthy it is. So my book's conclusion, I've just given you a very quick overview, is that the IPCC is an organization that doesn't describe its own personnel, its own reports, or its own procedures accurately. That's pretty basic stuff. And if it can't do that, why would we imagine that it has understood far more complicated questions and that it has come to the right conclusions? So um, my message as a journalist to lawmakers is be very careful when you hear that the IPCC says that um, it, has, it has reached this conclusion or that we should do, um, proceed down this path because this is not a trustworthy organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. And we still have a good role, don't we, for investigative journalists despite all that's going on at the moment. Thank you so much. And I have a personal response, if I may, Donna, because during the 2000s, I was one of the few voices that was saying that the IPCC was politically decision-making. And, of course, I was taken every now and again to complaints, all the rest of it. And, of course, what we've seen unravelling, and through not just your own work, but all has just been a vindication of that position. I said it openly in the great global warming swindle, some of you will remember, and, in fact, it's, it's been criticised since, but, of course... We've learned a lot more. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I'm sure people will want to read your book. I'm absolutely certain about it.